You scream and fall into my arms and we'll go out and party. Man, it's not worth getting that hung up about. If that's the way you're going to take it, I really don't want to talk about it with you at all. What about Gene? You guys in trouble, huh? I should have been more careful. I'm sorry. Isn't it fun? Nobody can wait except me, right? Well, maybe that's up to you. you being through with all your midterms oh fair listen after what those tests did to me i could not survive another one well thomas i may not survive if i don't get back to good old smith hall and make like a chemistry student well gene wait gene 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 gene, gene, gene. how about if i bribe you would you check the old chem book for a significant bribe no i'd love to but you know how important this test is to me yeah it means more than me right tom why do you do this do what? Oh, Tom Morgan, sometimes you make me so frustrated I could just scream. I got it. You scream and fall into my arms and I'll carry you off in the night and we'll go out and party, okay? Tom, good night. Jean. Something to eat? Nah, uh, maybe some other time. six-day bike races went through campus. I should have been more careful. Cute, cute. I'm like the class. Running my way, everything. I'm sorry. Hey, uh, yeah, so am I, huh? Hey, 
Hey, sit down, Tom. Thanks, Walt. Hey, I'm uh, sorry I'm late. Hey, no There's problem. This girl that... No problem. You know, I just got here a few minutes ago myself. Stay there. Yeah, I see Trout. Johnson, yeah. So how you doing? Well, okay, I guess. Um, I hope. How did I do? Normally a D would be for disastrous. In this case, D is for danger. I should have failed you. Oh, wow. Tom, I've had you for several semesters, and I think I've gotten to know you pretty well. Now, up to this point, you've been an excellent student. I got the feeling something's up. All right, what gives? Girl problems? Well, there's nothing special there. Sometimes I feel like I'm in competition with a chemistry book, but that's nothing new. You know, it wasn't so many years ago that I was matching my own socks and looking for part-time jobs and worrying about midterms. I know there's a lot of things that can get to you when you're in college. Yeah, that's a fact. I don't know, I, I feel sort of cut loose. I mean, for starters, I'm bombing out in all my classes. And things with Gene aren't going that great. And, I, and I'm sort of out of touch with my folks. I don't know. I'll tell you something that, that might help. Do you remember last year in our study of humanism? We found that when a man is not fulfilled uh, in the view of himself, or his society, or his environment, he's at odds with himself. He feels estranged and alienated. He begins to question everything he's doing. Well, I feel this is probably where you're at because I've been through it myself. And believe me, the intelligent, educated man makes himself. What are you trying to tell me? Tom, you're an intelligent, educated person. You have the innate capacity to become whatever you want to be. Well, I'll think about it, okay? Tom, it's up to you. Whatever you want to be. Guess again. Uh, uh, Millard Fillmore. No. One more guess. Uh, Gene of Arc. No fear, you peaked. Mm, just lucky. Hey, uh, how'd the world's most important chemistry test go? Now, come on. It was important. It went fine. How are you? Uh, torn. Between joining the French Foreign Legion and sailing around the world on an inner tube. That bad? Worse. Hey, you want to do me a favor? Sure. How about going to the beach this afternoon? I'd love to. Great. But... Boom. Now, come on. I've got an important meeting with my counselor this afternoon, and it can't wait. No, no, no. Nobody can wait except me. Now, Tom, don't start that again. Look, after this afternoon, I might just have some terrific news. Like what? Like, wait. What? See you later. disease has two factors. One is the environmental factor which assists the spread of the disease and the other is the organism. And I can say that after traveling to more than 500 universities in 50 countries, meeting with those that call themselves quote revolutionary leaders and students that are concerned, I've come to the conclusion that the revolution occurring in education and sociology today is not revolutionary enough. It seems to be dealing with the symptoms or the surface manifestations to the preclusion of a deeper root cause or problem. Some of you will say, well, the problem today is ignorance. That if a man knows better, he will do better. If he knows different, he will do different. Therefore, we need to bring the weight of education onto the scene and apply it. 
Gogol, the Russian dramatist, the author of The Overcoat, said, quote, how much inhumanity there is within man, how much furious rudeness in his refined, educated, good breeding. Oh, God, even in man whom the world professes noble and honorable. An educated person usually has that same inward drive for power and desire for racism and hatred and envy and jealousy and materialism that usually no amount of education will eliminate. Now the humanists will come to me, say, look, what you need to do is take man, take his resources, educate him, and everything will work out okay. Well, I think the predicament of the humanist is the humanist predicament. I think humanism is more part of the problem than part of the solution. What these people tell me, when they say you take the perfect structures, cram man into it, he'll see the benefits of it, he'll see it's better to give than to receive, better to love than to be loved, and everything will be changed. What I think they're doing is this. They're going out and catch a skunk, bring a skunk into the house, change his environment, apply the shower of technology to him, put a red river on his neck, spray cologne on him, and call him Old Spice. Sure, his environment's been changed. He's been educated, he's been powdered and perfumed, but his basic nature has not been changed. And as a farm boy, I can well testify to what happens when a skunk gets scared. And what most people are trying to do today is to powder and perfume the problems. My thesis is this. It's not enough to change the structures around man without concomitantly or at the same time changing the individual that makes him up. Because until men are changed individually, society would never be changed collectively. When I look at the political, economic, social exploitation that we have, when I look at the racism, the hatred, the envy, the jealousy that inundates our society, I look at these basically as individual problems that become a part of man collectively and society as a whole. This is one reason why a man living almost 2,000 years ago made sense to me, and that was Jesus Christ. And the thing that made sense to me about Jesus Christ is that he taught that the basic problem is with the individual, not the structures around them. Have you ever analyzed peace? We'll never have international peace and we have national peace. And we'll never have national peace and we have peace in the local level. And we'll never have peace in the local level and we have peace in that dynamic individual level of personal relationships. And that's where I believe that Jesus Christ is relevant, and that dynamic individual level of personal relationships. when you were a kid? Are you kidding? Listen, I was regional sandcastle building champion. <laughs> hey, come on. I was undefeated now. Hey, come on. Oh. <laughs> hey, how things go with Morel? D. For depressing. Huh. That bad, huh? It was worse. I, uh... Yeah, I should have flunked. You know something? I used to be pretty good at this. The fact is, there's a lot of things I uh, used to be pretty good at. Used to be. Hey, come on. What do you mean by that? Well, well, like in high school. I mean, well, I was getting good grades. I had a couple varsity letters. And I, uh, 
getting along with my folks. Well, and I had a couple girlfriends. You know, the standard success story. Yeah? So? Come on, that, that hasn't all stopped, has it? No, it's not, not so much that it's stopped. It's like, well, it's slowing down. And I feel like I'm losing control. My grades are going down to the point where I'm getting close to trouble. What about Gene? Uh-oh. You guys in trouble, huh? Uh, it's probably me. You know, but I get the feeling I'm playing second string to a Bunsen burner. And the same with my folks. I mean, the checks still keep coming, but... Ever since I've been away at school, it's like out of sight, out of mind. I feel like the only thing I have to hang on to is what happened two, three, four years ago. Because nothing is going right in the present tense. Yeah, I know. I... I felt that way, too. But... I've been able to find a way out of that type of feeling. You know, that kind of drifting along without any kind of goal. Yeah, yeah, Walt Morell, uh, well, he told me I've got to turn things around for myself. Is that what you're going to tell me? No, because I don't happen to believe that either one of us can turn things around on our own. Oh, I see. You're going to tell me that I should try letting God into my life. You've tried that before. Yeah, you're right. I have. And I still think... Just, just hold it! Hey, look out for the way! Why don't you go to bed, huh? Yeah. yeah, I guess you're right. Glad to see you could make it, Tom. <laughs> okay. Now, generally, as you know, I don't open the class to outside speakers. However, bowing to popular pressure, I've invited Mr. Josh McDowell to speak to us this morning. Some of you have seen the multitudinous posters for his various lectures. Mr. McDowell, excuse me, has degrees in economics, language, and theology. He's been a visiting lecturer on over 500 campus universities. He's the author of two best-selling books. It's a lot of books. <laughs> now, here's Mr. McDowell. And be sure to handle him gently. He's a guest. I appreciate uh, being a guest here, but you don't have to handle me gently. If you have any questions while I'm speaking, don't hesitate uh, to interrupt me, and I'll try to answer them. What I'd like to do in this class, since it's a philosophy class, is deal with some of the misconceptions that I had about Christianity, because I think it will help you to evaluate some of the things that you hear in class. Now, one of the first misconceptions I had was this. I thought the Christian faith was an ignorant faith. But after I investigated, I found out that basically it's an intelligent faith. Never is an individual called upon to commit intellectual suicide in making a decision for Jesus Christ. Another misconception I had was an area of history. I used to think that the Christian faith 
was sort of a philosophical faith. In other words, it was just a set of ideas or concepts that you believed. But after I studied it, I found out that the Christian faith is an historical faith. It's based upon the life of its founder, Jesus Christ, and an event within history, the resurrection. Now this brings up the question, and how does one define history? Well, I define history as a knowledge of the past based upon testimony. Now there's one problem with that definition, and can anyone here see it? Is the testimony reliable? That's right. Is the testimony reliable? Okay, then. Well, take the scriptures. Are they reliable? Can they be verified? Are they reviewable today? I think they can. Well, that's your prerogative, but... I... Let me give you an example. I was in a history class, and I made the statement that I believe there is more evidence for the reliability of the New Testament than any ten pieces of classical literature put together. And the professor sat over in the corner just snickering. Well, I said, well, you know, what are you snickering about? He said, well, the audacity to make the statement in the history class that the New Testament is reliable. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, I appreciate when somebody makes a statement like that because I always like to ask this one question, and I've never had a positive response yet in the classroom. I said, tell me, sir, what are the tests that you apply to any piece of literature of history to determine its reliability or accuracy? And the amazing thing is, he didn't have any tests to back up what he was doing. I said, sir, I have three tests. One is a bibliographical test. What is the distance from the time of the original manuscript to the closest copy we have today? Because realize, literature of antiquity was written on material that would perish, so they'd have to recopy it and recopy it. For example, from the time that Plato wrote to the closest manuscript that we have is 1,200 years. From the time Thucydides wrote, to the closest manuscript is 1,300 years. Herodotus, the well-known Greek historian, from the time he wrote, to the closest manuscript is 1,300 years. In fact, from the time that Aristotle wrote his poetics, to the closest manuscript is 1,400 years. Now, men and women, when it comes to the New Testament, it's almost embarrassing for the Christian. For example, we go back within 100 years with the John Ryland papyri, 125 A.D., and then we have the Chester Beatty papyri, 155 A.D. And then we have the papyri Bodmer II, 200 A.D. Now these are various portions of the scriptures. Now, there's more evidence time-wise than almost any ten pieces of classical literature put together. Now, the other part of the test is this. How many manuscripts do we have? You see, the more manuscripts you have, the easier it is to reconstruct the original to check out any inaccuracies. Now let's look at the secular sources. Plato, we have seven manuscripts. In other words, everything in the library of this university on Plato comes from one of seven manuscripts. Of Thucydides, eight. Herodotus, eight. Everything in this library and Aristotle and the poetics that he wrote comes from one of only five manuscripts, which was 1,400 years after he died. Now when it comes to the New Testament, we have more than 14,000 copies. Now, I think the evidence for the reliability of the New Testament is as great, if not more, than any other piece of literature of antiquity. Yeah, but he made sense. Of course he made sense. He wouldn't be traveling around the country if he didn't make sense, Okay, okay, I understand that. <laughs> but his logic factor was tight. I mean, he didn't even slip once, not even when Jeff asked him that question. You know, maybe I should reevaluate your last semester's grade in logic. What do you mean? I mean that one of the first things we talked about was the fact that careful construction of a premise in any argument can work to advantage. Right. You mean McDowell set us up? In a way. He worked from several points of mutual understanding. Things he assumed and then he told us to assume. Then he built an argument. It was clear and logical and hard to attack. And your question didn't even phase him. He was hoping somebody would ask. Yeah, but you know something? I mean, when he was finished, there was a lot to think about. To think about, right. But not to buy into. Do you remember what we talked about yesterday? That the intelligent, educated man makes himself. And what's important is what's inside, not the possible truth of a book written nearly 2,000 years ago. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. The 
Listen, I've got some terrific news. Great. You know, I could really use some good news. Okay. Last semester, I applied for the junior year in Europe program. Yeah. And I got it. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. That's the word for it, all right. Exciting. Tom, I... I thought you'd be excited for me. Oh, I'm excited for you. I mean, you're going to take off for a year. I'll probably never see you again. I didn't even know you were applying to leave. Tom, we've talked it over a hundred times about the fact that I wanted a career. And this trip is a fantastic opportunity for me. Oh, yeah. Opportunity for you. But what about us? Well, it certainly doesn't mean I don't care about you. I wanted you to be happy for me. I didn't think you'd act like a third grader. What do you mean, a third grader? Well, honey, I'm taking off for a year. Isn't that great news? Tom, if this is the way you're going to take it, I really don't want to talk about it with you at all. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have an experiment to finish. Fine. Make it for supper. Didn't mm. see you. Nah. Went for a walk. Why would you have? Ah, mystery meat and refried fries. If you'd rather have the latest Playboy, I'd be glad to get it for you. No thanks. McDowell was in Morell's class today. Morell had him in class? Yeah, he was there. Took wow. up the whole period. Well, uh, what'd you think? I don't know. Some of the kids got pretty turned on by what he was saying. But I talked to Morell after class about what McDowell had to say. Yeah? Boy, he shot him down. You know, McDowell uses one of the oldest tricks in the book. Well, fact is, he does it pretty well. You see, he sets his own premise. And then he logically uses this premise to his complete advantage. And when he's got you nodding your head yes, he zaps you. so great, I feel like crying. <laughs> hey, you want to cry? Cry about that. Huh? huh? Oh. No, 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 the poster. I mean, the answer has got to be hoax. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, let's see. McDowell uh, sets up his own premise. Then uh, he uses his own argument to his complete advantage. And then... Uh, I, you know, I seem to have forgotten the rest of my logic lesson. Hey, I gotta go, okay? I'll, I'll see you later. Hey, what's going on? Hi, Tom. How you doing? Good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were just talking about McDowell's lecture yesterday in class. I was just saying that by, by logically dismissing Mr. McDowell, I don't in any way wish to imply that I don't believe in Jesus. The fact is, I do. In my own way, I believe. 
I believe that Jesus lived, that he was a good man, and he said some rather profound things. Yeah, but McDowell's not going to let you get away with that. His argument was that Jesus claimed to be and is the Son of God. Uh -huh. The obvious judgment, then, is Jesus was, as he claimed to be, or a liar or a lunatic. Well, isn't that another one of McDowell's setups? Tom, sometimes I wonder if you listen to me at all. I'll tell you what. If McDowell's logic bothers you, you go get another dose. You go to that lecture tonight, and write me a report on the flaws in his argument. Oh, come on. And if it's acceptable, I'll raise that last grade to a C. OK. Several years ago, I set out to refute Christianity. One of my heroes was Dr. Simon Greenleaf. He was the famous royal professor of law at Harvard. In fact, he's the man that put Harvard Law School on the map. Now, he was always kind of skeptical and putting down the Christians in his classes. One day, some of the Christians challenged him to take the laws of legal evidence and to apply to the resurrection. I thought it was a pretty good challenge. After much persuasion, he did that. In the process, he became a Christian. And he came to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the best established facts of history according to the laws of legal evidence administered in the courts of justice. I'd like to share with you tonight just a few things that I found as I set out to refute Christianity. Let us look at some of the things that took place during that first Easter. First, there was a solid rock tomb. It was a new tomb hewn out of a rock with an entrance about four and a half to five feet tall. Second, there's a hundred and some pound encasement around the body. It says that the body of Christ was prepared according to the burial customs of the Jews. Third, a large stone is rolled against the entrance of the tomb. Several professors wrote me after they heard my lecture on this, and they'd gone to Israel. They were engineers, and they calculated the size of the stone needed. They said it would have to weigh from one and a half to two tons to close a door four and a half to five foot tall. Next precaution, a Roman guard unit or custodian was placed at the entrance of the tomb. Now, a guard unit was a four to 16 man force. Each man was trained to protect six square feet of ground against an entire invading army. Next, they put a seal over the stone. Now, that seal stood for the power and the authority of the Roman Empire. Now, look at the situation after the resurrection. First of all, the seal was broken. Now, when that seal was broken, the FBI, CIA, and everything else of the Roman Empire was thrown into finding that man or men. And when they were found, it was automatic crucifixion upside down where your guts run into your throat. Second, the stone was rolled up a slope away from the entire sepulcher, not just the entrance. And then you have the Roman guard unit. If one of those men fell asleep, failed in any way, he was not the only one put to death. The entire 16-man security unit was put to death for one person's mistake. Then you have this problem. The tomb was not empty. Peter and John ran to the tomb, and it says John leaned over and looked in. He looked over where the body of Christ had been placed. And there were the grave clothes. The head piece where the head was, the body piece where the body was, caved in a little, but empty. The body of Christ had passed right through it into a new existence. Something happened almost 2,000 years ago that this world has not gotten over with yet. And you ought to look at some of the theories that people try to present to explain away the resurrection. This one's cool. The women went to the wrong tomb. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Even though it was a private burial area, they saw the body of Christ prepared everything, they went to the wrong tomb. Well, then I guess you'd have to say the men went to the wrong tomb. And then the Jews went to the wrong tomb. And then the Romans went to the wrong tomb. <laughs> Man, that takes a lot of faith. <laughs> More than I could ever drum up. Now, here's a big one. It's what I call the swoon theory. Now, this one says that Jesus really didn't die. In other words, he passed out, lost a little blood, put in a damp tomb, resuscitated, and went out and conquered the world. Now, this is what they'd have to say took place. They took and drove spikes into his hands and his feet, and they brought the cross up and dropped it into the hole. They crucified him. Didn't kill him. The soldiers came along, thrust a spear into his side, and the eyewitness account said blood and water came out separated. Even a nurse can tell you that's a sign of death. Three professional executioners signed his death warrant. They must have all been mistaken. They took him down, wrapped him in a hundred and some pounds of linen cloth and spices. I guess he just breathed through it all. <laughs> they put him in a damp tomb, 
rolled a one half to two ton stone against the entrance, sealed it, and put a Roman guard there. That tomb, instead of killing him, healed him. And he must have jumped up, <laughs> hobbled over to the stone, pushed the stone out of the way, tied the guard unit up with his linen cloth, appeared to his disciples as Lord of Life. Now, there are a lot of other theories, but almost all of them have the same type of reasoning. I am convinced of one thing, that the burden of unbelief when it comes to the resurrection is greater than the burden of belief. Now, everything I've shared here tonight is completely documented in my book, and you can check it out. Something happened almost 2,000 years ago this world hasn't gotten over with yet. Something happened that took 12 men, turned their lives upside down, 11 of them went out and died a martyr's death for one thing, an empty tomb. Christianity is a bodiless religion. If there'd been a body, there wouldn't have been any Christianity. Hey, how's the King of the Ten speak? Making it. Hey, do you think this book could improve my cycling? Well, it could do wonders for your attitude and your vocabulary. If Jesus didn't die, then when did he die? Jesus Christ is alive. And that very power that brought Jesus Christ out of that grave today is available to change any man or woman in this world today. I don't know. I just don't see how you could prove the resurrection idea scientifically. Tom, good to meet you. Um, I saw you lecture in my philosophy class. Oh, I don't mean to bother you. That's okay, but, no problem. Well, Here, put up a chair, sit down. Thanks. Well, I've been reading your book, and uh, this might sound like a silly question, but could you prove the resurrection scientifically? Well, I don't think the issue is science. Uh, it's quite difficult to prove anything about a person or event in history. I think you need to understand the difference between the scientific and legal method of determining truth. Well, what do you mean? Well, the scientific method is based upon showing that something is true by repeating the event in the presence of the person questioning the fact. In other words, the truth of an hypothesis is tested by controlled experiments. Could you give me an example? I, I don't quite understand. Yeah, well, let's say I say uh, ivory soap floats, and you say I don't believe it. Well, I get you in the kitchen, in controlled situation, we get eight and a half inches of water in the sink, 82 degrees, and I start to repeat the event, just kind of, you know, plunk, 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 and after a hundred times, we come to the conclusion ivory soap floats. Now, if that was the only method, Tom, of determining what is or what happened, you couldn't prove that you went to your first hour class this morning. In fact, you couldn't even prove you went to the class where I was speaking because it can't be repeated in a controlled situation. Yeah, that makes sense, I guess. See, there's also the other method, which is called the legal method. Now, the legal method is based upon testimony. In other words, the verdict is reached on the sufficiency of the evidence. Now, this involves three things. One is oral testimony, written testimony, and exhibits, such as a bullet, uh, a gun, or a textbook, etc. Now, using that method, you could pretty well prove you were in your first hour class this morning. The professor remembers you. Uh, your friends could give testimony to it. You have your notebooks with, you know, your notes in your own handwriting. Now, the scientific method is not appropriate for answering or refuting such questions as, did George Washington live? Was Martin Luther King a civil rights leader? Was John F. Kennedy assassinated? Who was Jesus of Nazareth? Was Jesus raised from the dead? See, these events cannot be repeated in a controlled situation. So the question 
is the resurrection uh, scientific or can you prove it scientifically is out of order. Uh, you have to apply the legal method, which is based upon testimony. Well, these men that gave their testimony, couldn't they have been wrong? I don't think so. You see, here were 12 men, Tom, and 11 of them died martyrs' deaths for one thing, an empty tomb and the appearances of a man by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, some people will say to me, well, look, a lot of people have died for a lie. Yes, but they thought it was the truth. Now, if the resurrection was a lie, here were 11 men that knew it. Realized they wrote as eyewitnesses. In Acts, they said for 40 days they lived and walked and ate with Jesus. So if the resurrection was a lie, these 11 men knew it. And therefore, you'd have to say they not only died for a lie, but they knew it was a lie. And I would challenge you to find 11 men in history that not only died for a lie, but knew it was a lie. You see, they signed their testimony in blood. They went through the test of death to determine their veracity. And tell you the truth, I'd rather trust their testimony than most people I meet today who aren't willing to walk across the street for what they believe, let alone die for it. But do you, you know, do you understand what I've been saying here? Well, more or less. Tell you what, tonight I'm speaking again. Why don't you come to the lecture? And, you know, if afterwards you got any questions or anything, come on up. I'll be glad to answer them for you. Thanks. Okay. It's good to meet you. Yeah, I know I took your logic class, and I tried to remember those principles when I saw McDowell speak, but I can't find any flaws in his argument. Tom, I think you may be letting this get in the way of what's really bothering you. Or perhaps you've lost your sense of proportion. And maybe it's because you're, you're down on yourself. Tom, don't be so hard on yourself. You're an intelligent, capable guy. Hey, Tom, if it's any help, I can get hung up in McDowell's line, too. When you stop to remember that he's talking about something that happened or didn't happen 2,000 years ago, then it's not worth getting that hung up about. All right, so what if Jesus did come back from the dead? What difference does that make to us? Tom? Do yourself a favor. Midterms are over. Oh, boy. <laughs> no big assignments for Monday. Go on, take the weekend off. Go lie on the beach. Take Gene to the zoo. Anything to get away from that pressure here. And I'll even give you an A for going to McDowell's lecture. All right. <laughs> Speaking of Gene, I see the little lady now. Oh, boy. Hi, Gene. You looking for Thomas the Thinker? Uh, Jeff, uh, let me buy you another cup of coffee, huh? Uh, no thanks, Doc. I've had enough. No, 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 you haven't. Huh? Oh, you're right, Doc. I think I will have another cup. Hi. Hi. How are you? I've got a lot bouncing around in my head. How about you? So do I. Can we go someplace and talk, Tom? Sure. I want to talk to you about Europe. Oh. Well, what'd you decide? I'm going, Tom. I really want to go, and it's too good a chance to pass up. I know how you feel, but you've got to understand that this could make the difference in my career, in my life. Well, in mine, too. Tom, if we've got anything going, it'll last for a year, even if I'm in Europe. Will it? Well, maybe that's up to you.
You ready to let it out now? What do you mean? Whatever it is, it's bothering you. I don't know. Things just aren't going my way. Jean wants to split to Europe. Walt Morrell says I'm okay, but I don't feel okay. I don't know. Dave, I just don't know what to do. Yeah, I... I hear you. And... I don't know how much stuff like that can weigh you down. Yeah, but you don't have any of those things hanging on you. If, uh... If you want to listen... I can tell you why I don't have any of those things. Well, come on. Don't start that God business again with me. So what if a guy named Jesus came back to life 2,000 years ago? What difference does it make? Look, it makes a lot of difference, Tom. I don't happen to believe that Jesus was just a great man or a great teacher. I... Because he came back from the dead proves to me that he was the son of God. And because he is, he has the power to enter a person's life and change him from the inside out. I haven't always been a Christian. I... There was a time when I felt the same way you do. And then Tom, Tom, someone introduced me to the person of Christ. And I found that I could have a very real and meaningful relationship with him. It, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying that, that all my problems immediately went out the window. No, I... There were some changes made in my life that gave me the ability to deal with those problems. Now, everything's not great. All the time. I have tough things, too. Like, you know, Last summer, my dad died. And, uh... That, you know, that, that was mighty hard to take. I loved my dad, and we were really close. I, you know, I couldn't understand it. I, I wanted to argue with God about the whole thing. But, then, uh, then Jesus reminded me that he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> because of the resurrection, I know I'm going to see my dad again. <laughs> oh, man, I thank God for that. Think it over. Right. In my mind, it seems so clear to me, and yet I can't imagine how it all could be. 
see how he's changed in people's lives. I just can't see him doing that for me. I guess I. Understand, but somewhere along the way, I close my mind. It often seems I don't want to hear the truth, as if I'm still afraid of what I'll find. December the 19th, 1959, at 8.30 at night, I committed my life to Christ, accepted him, became a Christian. He said, well, how do you know? I said, look, I was there when it happened. It changed my life. In about six months to a year to a year and a half, my entire life was transformed. One area that changed in my life is one I'm not proud of. I'm ashamed of it. It's an area of hatred. I had a lot of hatred in my life, but there's probably one person I hated more than anyone else in the whole world, and that was my father. He was one of the town alcoholics. I despised everything that he stood for. I remember I used to go out in the barn, see my mother beaten so bad in my father she couldn't get up and walk. I don't think anyone could have hated anyone more than I did my own father. But men and women, after I made that decision for Jesus Christ in 1959, the love of God through Jesus Christ inundated my life. And it was so strong, it took that hatred and turned it right upside down. So much so, I was able to look my father square in the eyes and say, Dad, I love you. Well, I shook my dad up after some things I'd done. He said, son, how can you love a father such as I? I said, dad, all I know is that I gave Christ the opportunity to come into my life, and through this relationship, I found the capacity to love and accept not only you, but other people just the way they are. Well, about 45 minutes later was one of the greatest thrills of my life. My own father prayed with me right there and accepted Christ as his Savior and Lord. My father only touched whiskey once after that. Got his lips, and that was it. He didn't eat anymore. About 14 months later, he died because three-fourths of his stomach had to be removed through so many years of drinking. But in that 14-month period, various people in my hometown and surrounding area committed their lives to Jesus Christ because of the changed life of my father. Now I've come to one conclusion. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ changes lives. Some of you are saying, well, Josh, I'd like to accept Christ as my Savior. Now remember, Christ said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Now I don't ask you to bow your heads or even to close your eyes. You know why? I have found that the key to prayer is not in the position of the body, but the attitude of the heart. You can't give God a snow job. Now this is a prayer I prayed, and maybe it'll help you. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me and cleanse me. Right this moment, I accept you as my Savior and Lord. Change me from the inside out. In Christ's name, amen. Now, many of you prayed that prayer with me. And if you did, I want you to go home tonight, and I want you to dust off the Bible and turn to the third chapter of John. Read John 3 six times before you go to bed tonight. What was that we were supposed to read? Uh, John 3. Hey, can I borrow a Bible from you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs>